So we are at the time now where we're going to have Kathy Magdal come up and share her story about being drawn in and escaping from the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. We can't call them Mormons anymore, right? So, uh, without any further ado, and please, because I'm not giving it, please give us a little introduction about your background too. Kathy Magdal. tell you how much I appreciate that. We have a, a ministry in our church called Barnabas. Yes. And it's wonderful. Yep. And I personally have dealt with some of those kids and they're so sweet. So, oh, press the button. Just push it down a little more for you. Oh, put on the glasses and I can see. Okay, this is my countdown. It's not counting down. It's telling me I'm going to talk forever. Here we go. Okay. Um, we've heard a lot about Jehovah's Witness, and actually, after hearing about that, I'm really thankful I became a Mormon. I think it's easier. <laughs> <laughs> they have many more roles than we have. But um, I want to let you know that I didn't grow up a Mormon. My family, they were not Mormon. So I come a little bit different than these people who were raised as JWs. That's what we call them in the Mormon church. Um, but I was lucky in that, because it was a Mormon, with a JW building down the road from us, um, there were four houses in our neighborhood, two of which were Mormon. They learned that we were marked off their list. They never, ever bothered us. <laughs> One good point. Okay, so I'm going to talk to you today about my decision to join the LDS Church, my commitment to the church for like 20 plus years, what caused me to re-examine those beliefs and eventually leave, and what my life and faith are like now. And I want you to know, those speakers have spoken before. This is my first time, for lack of better words, coming out. <laughs> because I've talked to people individually, but I've never talked to a group about this. One of the reasons is, um, I have a lot of friends who are Mormons. I don't want to offend them. I, you know, I only wish the best for them. I just want to be left alone. So, a um, little story first. One day, the church I go to now, um, the senior pastor was with uh, the elders doing a prayer walk, and he saw me sitting at the desk, and he came over and he said, tell, tell them my story, my story, in just a few words to the elders. So I looked at him and I said, once I was Mormon, now I'm not. And he gave me that look, you know that look and said, uh, I meant a few more words. And I thought, well, maybe I could get away with saying that here. But then I was told I had more time. So I guess that's not going to work. So my story really begins, I was in my 30s. I know I look like I'm 30 now, but I'm not. It begins when our sons were very young. And you can tell how long ago that was because they are now 36 and 40. So. Um, it was at that time I decided that uh, I, I wanted to go to church. I wanted to introduce them to um, God. I felt it was time for them to learn, like I had learned as I was growing up. So I decided to check out a couple of churches close to home. One of them was the United Churches of Christ, which had changed their name. It was congregations when I was, I was baptized as an infant in the Colonial Church of Edina. I'm sure some of you have heard of it. Big church. Um, my grandparents had been members. My family had been members. So I thought, hmm, good church to try. And then a Lutheran church. However, both experiences were so disastrous, I didn't think I'd ever entered the doors of a church again. Um, sidebar, my husband said, you got to share the reason why you didn't go to those churches. The first church, the um, Congregational Church, or United Church of Christ, I went to church. I came home, I told my husband, he gave the weirdest sermon I've ever heard in my life. And I had the program, and I threw it out. And my husband is a firefighter. He got called out on a fire call to this church later on that week. And um, he called me, middle of the night, and he said, do you still have that program? I said, yeah, why? And he said, the minister lit himself on fire. So, um, 
a lot of things had happened that week to that minister. He had nowhere to turn. He made it look like a robbery, lit the kitchen on fire, which caught himself on fire. So that freaked me out. <laughs> The other church was um, a Lutheran church, and I happened to go on Mother's Day. So you'd think it'd be wonderful. You know, God praise Mother's sermon? No, it was all about how this woman who belonged to the church had had a falling out with her daughter and so left everything to the church, only to when she finally passed away, the church found out that she and the daughter had reconciled, and she left everything to the daughter. And the minister talked about how awful that was. I have to say, I was actually nauseous as I walked out. I did not want to go there. So, needless to say, I was a little... So I kind of let that slide for a while. And then shortly after that, we moved to a neighborhood. Um, great family living next door. They had kids the same age as ours. Everybody connected right away. We became good friends. and. Their daughter walked in one day and saw a Book of Mormon on the shelf in our living room. And she said, I didn't know you were a member of our church. I said, what church? I hadn't even remembered we had the book, that we had heard the discussions many, many years before, but we were young newlyweds, and that didn't fit into our partying lifestyle. So um, I said, well, I am looking for a church. First mistake, you never say that to a Mormon. So they invited us to attend. First, not a service, though, attend some of the family gatherings. People were wonderful. It was fun. Families connected. My boys just fell in love with the kids. And so I started attending on Sunday. And of course, they know when you're an investigator because you're not dressed accordingly. You don't walk in that church without a skirt on, and it can't be a short skirt. Or if you're a man, you better have a suit on. Otherwise, they go, I have an investigator. I'm not a member. And of course, everybody's after you. Um, so I intended off and on. And uh, eventually, I agreed to meet with the missionaries to learn more about the church. Now, I was what they referred to as a golden investigator. Completely open. I was looking for a church. I had already met many of the criteria. And um, I had the Swedish missionaries ever. They were just wonderful. One was from Liverpool, who doesn't like a British accent. And the other, my husband always said, you should be a vacuum cleaner salesman. You'd sell it to anybody. Um, so they were wonderful. They were very patient. But they kept telling me I was moving so much slower than any of the other investigators. And I said, well, not until I'm ready. Not until I'm ready. So um, as they taught me, I was meeting, also, I'd been going to a Bible study with my sister-in-law, right over there, <laughs> the guilty party, um, and we would meet. I would meet with the missionaries, and then we would meet, and I started going the Mormon route, and she started going, you know, she stayed on track, um, but eventually it made sense to me. It made sense to me because um, what I was witnessing on Sundays were families coming together, family time. Um, Everyone was so nice, and when we did activities, it was as a family, and it just, everything I'd been searching for. So, and as they led me through the Bible and the Book of Mormon discussions, because they always have the Bible, and I think the reason they use the King James is to confuse you. Now that I'm not reading that, it is so much easier. But, um, so they led me through them, and it seemed like the beliefs were more in keeping with Bible principles, than churches I've been looking at. As I told you earlier, those two were disastrous. So I thought, well, after all, they believed in God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost, but not the man-made word Trinity. Okay, that, I thought, well, that's interesting. They're st sticking to the Bible. They didn't invent these words. So then, um, and they also believed that cross was only a symbol. If you've noticed, Mormon meeting houses we do not call, they were not called churches, they're called meeting houses. Um, there's no cross in a temple. There's no cross. They said it's a symbol and they no need to display it. They really believed um, keeping the Sabbath day holy. In other words, no shopping, no movies. If you were out of milk, too bad, things like that. But it was a day to reflect and to spend time with family and then tithing. And they believed in works, not only faith. And they share Bible passages like 
James 2, 17, which says, So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. And James 2, 24, you see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. Made sense. Um, I couldn't believe, now remember, this is the 80s. Remember those days. Some of you, I'm looking at some of you saying, no, you might probably weren't even born. But um, I, I just couldn't believe that all you had to do was say you believed in Christ and you were saved. There had to be more than that. And if you remember, that whole thing came out in the 80s about people saying, I believe, and they were saved, and all this. So I was really convinced that a church that taught both works and faith being necessary for eternal life was what the Bible taught. At that time, the differences seemed really small, so insignificant when I was an investigator. And they called themselves the true church. I think the what was it, the uh, Jehovah's Witnesses were, were called something else, but we were the true church. And so in August of 1987, I decided to be baptized. Um, our boys at that time were four and eight. Eight is the age of baptism. The Mormon church feels that is the age that you understand right from wrong and everything else. My eight-year-old decided to wait because our neighbor was seven and was going to be eight in a few months, so he wanted to do it with his friend. So I was baptized. My husband never did join. He called himself the eternal investigator. He used to say to those poor, sweet, 19-year-old missionaries, if you could make me a good Manhattan, I'll listen to your words. And in fact, once he said, I need a sign. If I'm going to join, I need a sign. We got up the next morning. There was the front page of the Book of Mormon as a sign in our front yard, and they said, is this enough? So, um, but he was real supportive. He um, did not get upset when I was busy 20 hours a week, things like that. And um, now most of our friends were Mormon. Um, and we felt like one big happy family. I could count on them, they could count on me. It was really a great place to be at that point in my life. Um, it didn't take long to become completely immersed in the church and its beliefs. And you get very busy, you have nobody, and this also made sense to me, nobody in the Mormon church is paid. My bishop was my dentist. Um, at one point we had a bishop and two counselors that were all lawyers. So um, you were issued callings, supposedly. The bishopric prayed about it and they call you in and extend the calling. There are a few times I would say, are you sure this is inspiration and not desperation? Because I didn't feel like I was qualified to do that calling. Anyway, so um, you get really busy in your callings. Uh, one of my callings was young women's president, which was unusual for that because most often the bishop does not want anybody to serve in young women's unless one, they're married to a priesthood holder and two have been sealed in the temple for all time and eternity. Neither of those, which I was. So it surprised me, but I was called, and most of my career was spent with young women, the 12 to 18 year old girls. Um, I was also called once as primary president, and that didn't go so well. Those little kids scared me. But, um, and I was very involved in temple work, so much so that a group of six women and I went to Chicago once a month to learn. We had to memorize everything that was done in the temple because we were helping the people going through. Um, we had to memorize all that and then we became certified temple workers. So that meant that we had to go down to Chicago. We would leave after we put our kids on the bus, drive down, get there in time to do what's called one session and I'll go into, if you aren't familiar with the temple, I can talk about that later. Do a session, come back, get up at five in the morning to be at the temple to study and then help, assist, and then come back Saturday night in time to be ready for our callings on Sunday. Really exhausting. But we always made it a point to come home after the kids were put in bed. So um, then later, the Oakdale Temple was built here, which allowed me to be a weekly temple worker. I would go from work, to the temple to put in my time, whatever it was. And again, everybody volunteered. Nobody got paid for any of that. They did not let um, the maintenance crew, they had to be uh, 
temple recommend, they had to hold their temple recommend. A temple recommend is something you're given, I can't even remember, once a year, twice, or every two years. You'd be interviewed by your bishop and the state president. You had to be found worthy, which meant, and this is for those of you who aren't familiar, it meant that you had to be a full tithe payer, you had to be up to date on your tithing, you had to um, follow all the rules of chastity and tend your meetings, and there were also, and they, every time you would, you would meet with your state president, they'd ask you if there was any reason why you felt you were unworthy to attend a temple, and um, if you'd already been going to the temple, are you wearing your temple, your, your garments? Which is a whole other story. <laughs> I won't go into that. But um, so it was. It was a great experience. I felt really good there. I was serving people. It's a beautiful building. If any of you had the opportunity to go through a temple open house, I encourage you to do so. But um, so life was good. I love my friends. I love the young women I taught, which I am still in contact today with many of them, even though they've known I've left the church. Several of them have left the church. Um, and I just didn't have time to dig deeper into my faith. It was, you know, there were a few parts I didn't agree with, but um, I was too busy at the time. So, if you, I liked the Mormon Church as a family organization. It kept families together, teaches great pr principles. My youngest son is an Eagle Scout, which has helped him through his career because they honor that. Uh, and he wouldn't have done it if he was on his own, but that was their Wednesday night activities. So, um, it wasn't until I became more involved in the church and started serving in leadership positions that they have what they call ward leadership meetings, yeah, secret meetings, that they have that only the presidency of the different organizations, Relief Society, priesthood, things like that, meet, and they discuss people and things like that. I learned some things that I didn't know. One of the reasons I didn't know them is because I did not have a priesthood holder in the house. Certain things that the men learn, certain things the women learn. And so, you know, I was learning these things and going, wow, I didn't know that. Um, I think that was when I started to sense that something wasn't quite right. Um, one of the things that they said that bothered me, and I'm not sure, and I was talking to my oldest son the other day, and he said, I never heard that, and it was something I had heard, and I had to think about it, but it really bothered me. This was the very first thing I heard that really bothered me, and think about it, as man is, God once was, as God is, man may become. At the time, it was just words I didn't really listen, but then, I found it hard to believe that I personally could not have eternal life with God unless one, I was sealed in the temple with a man who was a priesthood leader. It could be, um, it would be better for me to be a single woman than married to a non-member. But I was told and convinced that God would work all things out for my good and not to worry about it. So I thought to myself, I basically supported what they believed and they told me it was going to be okay and I believed them. Like I said, uh, there were only a few points that didn't seem right in keeping with the Bible. I later came to understand that some of these were very important points that separated the Mormon beliefs from true biblical teachings. The most important is the difference between the Mormon God and the God of the, of the Bible. My kids were doing well. Most of them, most of their friends were in the church. As kids, they go through four years of seminary, which starts when they're in ninth grade, and they do Old Testament one year, New Testament, Book of Mormon, and the Doctrine and Covenants and Pearl of Great Price. It's done before school. So these kids get up at five in the morning to be to church at six in the morning. They go every day that their school's in session. They have to do that if they want to get into BYU and any other church affiliated colleges. And so um, my kids did that. It was hard for my oldest son because um, his epilepsy. So it was hard for him to get up that early because his meds kept him up at night. So I was home homeschooling seminary, which was interesting. Um, anyways, 
So it was uh, all those things. Kids were happy, I was happy, I had a lot of good friends. I truly felt like I was being a good Christian who kept all the roles, I was serving people, I never refused a calling or a chance to serve. So that was my life. And then in 2005, my mother began attending church with me. My father had passed away in 2001 and my, left a big hole in my mother's life. So she started coming to church with me. It gave us time together to bond. After all, we had three hours. You have the church service sacrament, and then you have Relief Society, and then I always had young women, so you have three hours. Um, so the missionaries started to visit her, and she loved those visits. She loved that people reached out to her and would bring her home over to their house for dinner. She felt like you know she had a life again. And so then one day in the car, she said to me, I'm thinking about joining the church. What do you think? And I thought a little bit about that, and I said, you need to do it because you believe, not because of my testimony. It just, you need your own. And so that was, I think, the broke the ice. It was my time to re-examine my faith, my beliefs, and to determine whether this is a church I wanted to stay in. And I had been struggling for a long time at this point. Didn't know where to turn, didn't know who to talk to. I know that my sister-in-law would have been more than happy to um, open that conversation. I knew she was a good resource. She probably knew more about Mormonism than I did at this point. But that awful thing called pride stopped me. So I started doing my own research. I put the Book of Mormon away. I pulled out the Bible. The only Bible I had at the time was King James. I stopped going to church every Sunday, and I backed down from some callings. Um, then my sister-in-law gave me this well-worn Bible. I don't know what possessed her. I just got rid of the note. I should have kept it, but it said, "This is there's no game plan. I'm just giving it to you because. And it happened to be the... Um, I can't even read it anymore. It's the English Standard Version. So much easier to read than the King James Version. So I started doing that. Well, my mother passed away suddenly in 2000, October 2005. She was never baptized in the church. She never told me she wanted to be baptized. But many of my friends came up. Her funeral was at the LDS church. Um, in, all those people said, because they'd been visiting her constantly uh, in the hospital for the two weeks she was alive, and they said, your mom wanted to be baptized. Well, I thought, oh, well, I didn't know what to believe because she hadn't told me that. But um, I knew I could take care of that in the temple because you can do baptisms for the dead. So I knew that I could do that, and then she could decide. But... I just couldn't quite bring myself to do that. I just wasn't sure, and I thought, she would have told me. She would have told me. So it was shortly after that, at that point, that my husband and I decided to downsize, and we moved, which was a blessing. Um, it was just what I needed, because it gave me the opportunity to step back from a ward, our um, organizations are similar to the Jehovah's Witness in that it, we go to ward buildings. We go to meeting houses for our Sunday and Wednesday thing, and we go to temples for other things. But um, you're grouped by where you live. So because I moved from Minnetonka to Eden Prairie, I went to a new ward, which meant I could be nobody. I could just sit back, do my research, and decide for myself. And it was hard. 19 years of this, it had been hard. Um, but it gave me a way to get out of the church and not have a calling. I had the breathing room to take time, sit back, think, pray, study, without being bothered by the ward leadership. Or so I thought. So that didn't last long. The new ward decided, oh, a new person. They got my records. And they, the, I got visiting teachers. Visiting teachers are two sisters from your ward who are supposed to come to visit you once a month, make sure everything is well, and give you a message. Um, home teachers, they're supposed to make sure the whole home life is going, and they also give you a lesson. And I said, 
I don't want to be contacted. I contacted the bishop and I said, I need space. Don't contact me. I'm stepping back. I need to reevaluate my faith and my membership at, in this church. Even though I said that, I was working in the temple. I thought, that's where I need to go. I need to go to regroup and to feel like I was right. This is the right faith. This is the right church. Um, and I would find it there. Well, I didn't. In fact, I was very uncomfortable sitting there because I didn't feel like I was qualified to have a temple recommend any longer because I couldn't without, excuse me, without saying, um, I'm not sure, I couldn't answer those questions anymore and feel good about it. So um, I quit going to the temple too. And in November of 2009, I made the decision to leave the church. So, and that is not, you just don't stop going. It's a whole process. I wrote to the church, certified mail, that I wanted my name removed from the Salt Lake Temple, the roles in Salt Lake. Um, and what I received back, and I did bring a copy of these, if anybody is interested in seeing what I went through. Um, I wrote, they wrote back and said that everything I'd ever done, every ordinance I'd ever performed in the temple for you know, doing work for the dead, whatever, was null and void. My baptism was null and void, everything. And if I ever wanted to come back, I had to go before a board to be approved. So, um, not only did I walk away from a church I'd been tending, and like I said, 20 hours a week easily involved, uh, most of my friends said, see ya. You know, if I wasn't in their clique, I was no longer their friends. Um, so most, there's a few that I still am in contact with and am close to, and we have agreed just not to discuss religion. <laughs> um, but one in particular I remember because we were out of town for the winter and I got these scathing emails from her about how I was making the biggest mistake of my life and that God was going to turn his back on me and I was going to go to hell and everything else, which I thought was interesting because they don't really believe in hell. They have three degrees of glory. And the celestial is, you know, where you're going to be with God and Christ. And then they have the terrestrial and they have the telestial. And the telestial, we were always taught, was like this earth. And I thought, you know what? That's fine. I'm okay, as long as I don't have to pay bills, I'm good for being here. It's never going to be enough work for me. It's never um, going to be anything. You know, I think I moved these out of place, but that's okay. Um, so, I was on my own. No church. I didn't want a church. And um, I kind of kept to myself after the trauma of leaving. I mean, it was like quitting from a job or lose, and losing your best friend. Um, I just didn't want to go to another church and fall into that. I thought after the first two churches I tried didn't work and this church was that, I just thought I'm going to work, teach myself. I'm going to read my scriptures daily as my connection to God. So that's what I did. I decided to do that. I didn't want to go to church. And when we moved, interestingly enough, we moved by a big church which I used to laugh at and call the big and spacious building because that's what the Mormons always taught us about all these fabulous churches that were going up because Mormons don't have mortgages on temples or on their church. Everything's paid for. It's a business. It's run like a business. And so here I was looking at this big and spacious building that lays empty for most of the week and I was going to go there. So in September of 2012, I decided to attend the huge church, the big, that big and spacious building up the road from where I live. I liked the size because I could sneak in, I could listen, I could go right out. I didn't have to talk to anybody or be asked any questions. You walk in a Mormon church, they know you're an investigator and they're there. So um, I listened. I enjoyed our pastor. It didn't take me long to really appreciate his messages every Sunday. They were exactly what I needed. I moved there, why? I don't know. 
I swore I'd never move where I moved either. So he taught from the Bible in just small bits. Like he would take one verse or one sentence and talk about it. And that's exactly what I needed to hear because I needed to relearn the Bible that I had been taught as a child because I had had all these years of the Mormon version of the Bible. Okay. So um, I was beginning at that point, listening to him help me to understand that I, the difference between God's word and what Mormons believed. I began to understand who God was and what Christ did for us and how there's nothing we can do to gain eternal life. Christ did it all at the cross and we just need to believe. I was told the reason there was no crosses in the Mormon world, anywhere you go, you won't find them if you go to a bookstore down in Salt Lake or whatever, is that they were a church that didn't focus on the resurrection. They focused, uh, oh no, they focused on the resurrection and not his death. And all these other churches were focused on him dying on the cross, not on the resurrection. Kind of a Mormon quirk, I think. But now I look at the cross and understand what it's all about. And it's grace and faith, not works. So, um, and, and I'm going to go a little bit into works based versus faith based. But before that, another interesting point I learned from just kind of one of those aha moments is um, Mormons believe we're all God's children. Therefore, Christ and Satan were brothers. What well, made sense to me at the time because we're all God's children. But um, my senior pastor's message one day said, we're all God's creation, but we're not all God's children, not until we accept Christ. And I thought, wow, that really made sense, and that just was unbelievable about, um, to me that, uh, yeah, that's perfect. That's what I'm reading. I'm, under, I'm actually understanding this. It's not that I was confused all those years. It's that the Mormons weren't teaching it right. Um, the other thing, he told a story about an individual who once looked at him and, and said, um, who created God? And just looked. And then the moment, person thought for a moment and then went, oh, he was the creator. No one created him. So I thought, well, so much for the as man is, God once was, and as God is, man may become, Mormon belief. That threw that one out. And I never really understood the difference between works-based church, faith-based church, because it talks about works in the Bible. You can, you know, you read about it all the time. I said, so to me that didn't really make a difference. I always thought they were the same, because Mormonism is a works-based church. I soon learned that what the Mormons believed is we have to do all we can do which is works-based, to reach our goal for eternal life, and then Christ will do the rest. I know that sounds stupid, but at the time it made sense. Um, but that's a really exhausting life to live. And that's why I said I just, I can't do it. The celestial kingdom is perfectly okay with me because I'm never going to make it to the celestial kingdom because I'm never going to do enough. Um, and it's really bad for someone like me who feels guilty all the time about everything. So, you kind of always feel guilty. It's not enough. You know, just one more, one more. Like reading a book, one more page and I take a break. One. That's kind of how um, doing things is like. I always felt like it was never enough. Never, ever, ever enough. And then I realized it's impossible to ever do enough to earn eternal life. So, um, one day, and this is where I calm down, because one of the things I learned, I fit in the Mormon world really good is because they always cry. They stand up and bear their testament and they always cry. And I always do that too. So I'm going to try not to do that. So um, I just kind of said, I quit. I quit. It will be what it will be. And then I understood. I understood what they meant was faith comes first. And then your heart is changed. And the works follows. It's just natural. And it was so refreshing and freeing to finally and fully understand what the Word teaches us. 
it's not just saying what I thought the, they were saying in the 80s. I'm a sinner and I believe. It's putting it all together and giving it up to Christ. He did it all and we can do no more but believe. So, and this is where I'm probably going to move. Um, in November, on November 4th, 2015, and I know you said hit a button. Where's the right? Open. What button? What button? What button? I'm going to play something for you. I said I'd do this in 10 minutes or less. Today, some of you who are new to Grace might be wondering why are there two people in a big tub in the front of the room? If that's the case, let me tell you, we are here to celebrate baptism today. And why do we do it? Uh, simple, because our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in Matthew chapter 3, he himself was baptized. And then in Matthew chapter 28, he commanded his disciples to go out and make more disciples and to baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And so that is what we're going to do here today. So, Kathy, why are you here to be baptized? I came to Christ a few years ago and decided it was time to publicly be baptized. Um, commitment to Christ. All right. And do you commit to live with Christ for the rest of your life? Yes. According to your confession, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. <laughs> For the moment my husband remembered and we had that recorded so I thought I'll bring it. So that was the, when I entered the waters of baptism for the very last time. I'm not going to do it again. Um, it was one of the best days of my life. And I thought it was interesting that uh, a few months ago Pastor Troy um, gave a talk that I wish all my Mormon friends or former friends could hear and understand. He said if you follow a false prophet, you'll join a false religion, you'll worship a false god, and end up in hell. So this is super serious. And according to Deuteronomy 18, 2022, 20, true prophets are 100% accurate, 100% of the time. Which, as I went through the Mormon church, our prophets would change their mind, and they were saying they had new inspiration. Well, so, during my entire walk through Mormonism, I had one person who always had put down. <laughs> I'm so good at this. She researched and studied and prayed for me. She never turned her back. You know, it's hard once you learn the truth to come to someone and say you've made a mistake, especially with something this important. I was embarrassed, I was ashamed, but I think if pride hadn't gotten in the way, I could have turned to her and I might not have had to go this path, but I think I needed it. I needed this path. I needed to find the church I'm at now. Um, it's just something so personal. personal. And what I encourage you, if you have someone that you know who is looking at the Mormon church or taking this walk and trying to leave, don't judge them, just come alongside of them and love them and tell them, don't tell them how wrong they were. Um, I know she would have done that for me because she loves me. And I found out after I left that her and a few friends had been praying for me for 20 years. And it just so happened the day I was baptized, one of those friends who doesn't go to the Grace Church decided to come that day. Not knowing I was going to be baptized, the only one I told was my sister-in-law's and my husband. And she was there, and it was like she looked up and she went, oh! I thought she was going to holler. But um, these are my friends now. So I have made new friends, Christian friends. They're sweet women. I appreciate them. They prayed so hard for me, even though they never knew me. Um, and I wanted to just share my sons, what became of my sons. My youngest son wrote a letter the same day I did to remove himself from the church. And at this point, he calls every religion a cult. He is so burned out. Um, after being brought up in the Mormon church, 
And then he, his first full-time job, believe it or not, talk about from the frying pan into the fire, he worked for a guy who he really liked, but he was a Scientologist. And being the general manager, Derek had to read all of Hubbard's books. So, needless to say, luckily he's got a Christian wife who hopefully will bring him back someday. My oldest son is the one with epilepsy, and um, he never, he has not left the church. He hasn't attended the church in, oh, I hate to say how long. And what is he doing? He's working part-time at Grace Church. He loves it up there. He's the tech person doing what he loves to do um, for the kids department. He loves the kids. And if you ask him what church he belongs to, he's going to tell you Grace. So it's been a great experience for us. And I have, like I said, I have a few things here that I, if anybody's interested, that I would like to share. And those are, one, this patriarchal blessing. Is anybody familiar with that? This is my patriarchal blessing. It is one thing I got, I think it was about a year after I joined the church, and it tells me that if I live worthy, this is what's gonna happen. I will leave that up, you can pass it around, whatever, I'll bring it up here. The other that I thought was interesting, these are things I came across this week as I was preparing. This is my letter asking to leave the church. And attached to that, then you'll see that the letters they wrote me, as well as sending me a nice little brochure of an invitation to come back to the church. So I have those. And it was funny to me as I was looking through this, I came across, I sent this letter on November 12th. On November 29th, I received this letter. Dear Sister Magdal, we want to express our deep appreciation for your service as an ordinance worker in the St. Paul, Minnesota Temple. Your efforts have been an important part of this Latter-day work. We commend you for your faithfulness to the principles and covenants you've entered into. We hope we will have the pleasure of seeing you in the temple as often as your circumstances permit. We wish you well and extend to you an honorable release from this sacred call. May the blessings of our Heavenly Father attend you and grant you peace and comfort. That was after I left the church. I just thought it was funny that they'd thank me. So, um, someone closed with, oh, you closed with Amazing Grace. Well, I kind of got a little bit hipper than that, I guess. It's all that Mormon music, they're not allowed to play guitars up during the sacrament. They can play violins and things, but guitars were not allowed because, I don't know. So, I uh, love being in a contemporary music church. So, in closing, I will share my words. One of my favorite contemporary Christian songs is by Matthew West, and it says, okay, here we go again. There's a war between guilt and grace, and they're fighting for a sacred space. Sorry. But I'm living proof grace means every time. Any questions? I actually had one. Sure. Um, I know yours wasn't Scientology, but uh, have you heard anything about Leah Remini? I know that she left Scientology. Do you, do you know how what her view of faith is now? No, I know that she does a thing on TV, and I have not watched right, it. Right, right. I kind of just close my mind now to any kind of cult. Sure. Because it'd be terrible for her to just walk away altogether when the truth is out there, just that she got sucked into Scientology. Yeah, it, you know, it, where you are in your life, and I think there was a reason I went through it all. Refiner's Fire, I don't know. I don't know why I did, but I don't regret the time I spent, the years in the church. I, the friends were incredible. It was during that time my oldest son had brain surgery, and they were incredible. I don't have a large family and so meals were provided at my house. They took, there was never a time that my son was without somebody by his side for three weeks in the hospital and I can't thank them enough for that. But that's friends, that's not faith. 
Any questions? Yeah. I, I have two questions. I'm sorry about that. That's okay. Um, the first one is, uh, is there any kind of two movement in the Mammon Mammo organization? Like, uh, sometimes I, I read um, there are this uh, school that believe in people, uh, polygamy, yeah, married uh, many wives, and there is another group that don't believe in that, but okay. So, what I heard, there's like 400 and some odd offshoots of the Joseph Smith, you know, Mormon faith, following in Joseph Smith as being the first prophet. Um, if you're in Salt, if you're in Utah and you have a friend that knows the area, they'll point out every polygamous house that exists as you drive through there. Um, I always said, you know, if I could pick the women, I would maybe be okay because I would want to be the fun one, and then someone could do the house cleaning. Some, but polygamous was was told, we, you know, that was done away with a long, long, long time ago. There are just some who said, no, I'm done. <laughs> Anyways, um, so that's not been part for a long time, but there are still sects out there that um, do practice polygamy. Okay. But they still call themselves uh, Mormons? They do. Okay. I mean, they, they will say they're Mormons. Mormons okay. will say they are not Mormons, but yeah. So why? Why? Why um, the difference between being called Mormon and being called Latter-day Saints? Well, they don't like being referred to as Mormons. They've tried this movement and it's, it's happening again. My sister-in-law might be able to address that better than me. I try to close my ears to anything that's happening. Um, it's the Book of Mormon, but they are the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. They want people to know that they believe in Christ, that that is who they stand for. And every time they try it, it doesn't make it because that's, they're just known for their Book of Mormon, mm. which they always say it's a, it's a complement to the Bible. It is the history of Christ coming to the Americas. So. My, my second question is that, uh, I, I don't know why I had that perception. They said, uh, there's this uh, hotel, Marriott Hotel belongs to mm -hmm. the Mormon Church? Mm -hmm. oh, okay. No, it does not belong to the Mormon Church. There are so many big business out there that are run by Mormons. The church is run like a business. Okay. They have no debt. Their temples are all paid for. Their meeting houses are all paid for. Um, and back when I was a Mormon, if you served a mission, you know, the young men and women go on missions for two years. The girls were at that time, I think, 18 months. I think now the girls are equal to the guys and they're both two years. Um, you paid, at that time it was $400 a month for your child to go on a mission. It didn't matter if they went to England and it cost a thousand, or they went to some little t place and it cost a hundred. They wanted everybody to be equal, things like that. So, um, but yeah, Marriott, I think uh, Kodak, when I was first called into the Young Women's Program, one of the things we, we would do is one Sunday a month, we would have um, a fireside, youth fireside, where they'd come to a house, we'd get a speaker in. Well, since this was a new calling to me, this had already been arranged, and the speaker that came in was the CEO of General Mills came to my house, and I said, oh, I've got the CEO, and it, there had just been an article in the newspaper that he was making like $540 an hour. So my husband and my neighbor figured out how much money he made just by going to the bathroom. So, <laughs> I mean, there are a lot of wealthy Mormons, just like there's a lot of wealthy, but yes, it is not, Marriott isn't owned by it, but when we go to the Chicago Temple, there's a Fairfield Inn right by there, and we got the LDS discount. And I think that's true of a lot of Marriott um, hotels that are close to temples, you get discounts. If you can show your temple recommend. What was that word you used? You said when uh, water prophets change their minds, and, what do they call that? New inspiration? New... Oh, um, 
Yeah, they were. No, I'm drawing a blank. Um, revelations. They go in the temple. They can go to a room called the Holy of Holies. I've never been there, but um, you know, they they gather there. They aren't. They get new revelation. You know, there was that revelation in Sharon Wynn about the priesthood, 1970. 78, okay, no. I was going to say 76, where the blacks could now hold the priesthood. Why? Well, I don't know. I mean, but they do have, and I just heard that uh, <coughs> they no longer are meeting three hours they, in a three hour block. Um, we used to, like I said, have sacrament meeting, and of course, the sacrament was given every <coughs> Sunday, where other churches only think it's necessary once in a while. Um, and then you'd have Sunday school, and then you'd go to Relief Society or whatever. Now they're two hours, sacrament, and every other week, one week Sunday school, the next week is Relief Society priesthood and young men's and young women. So they're bringing that down. I don't know why. I've heard that people are leaving in droves. It's a huge time commitment. It's a way of life. I mean, there's no drinking. You better, I mean, when we would take the kids to temple trips, if they came in with a night and do, it went in the garbage. So, because we had to practice the word of wisdom. Anybody else? Okay. Thank you, dear Lord. So we're going to take just a couple minutes while uh, Rick is setting up our next presenter. Get some coffee, get a snack over there, check out the table, say hello. We'll be back in just a couple of minutes. Thank you.